just wanted to give you an official welcome to today's core coffee chat featuring tips on organizing and pitching your ideas through grant proposals. I'm Nicole Lezen, I'm one of the consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, or CORE. And I do this work with Nicole Young, and we are your hosts today. As you can hear, our CORE Institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation. Today, Stella Lauerman is providing simultaneous interpretation and Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now. She'll also translate your comments and questions in the chat. And as always, we encourage you to use the chat function throughout today's session to uh, ask us questions or share a comment or tip of your own. And we will monitor your questions throughout the presentation today. And just start out perhaps by clicking on that chat icon and letting us know your name, the group or organization you're representing today, and maybe a little something about what brought you to today's core coffee chat. But while you're thinking about that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna walk us through a quick overview of core. Thanks, Nicole. And CORE, again, stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. And we think of it as both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County. And we do that using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we have a mission and a vision statement for CORE that were created through a collaborative process. And both of those really center around this idea of equity, making sure that everyone has opportunities to thrive uh, and have an experience health and well-being at every stage of life. And so when we actually talk about equitable health and well-being, we mean that we want all people across the lifespan to have opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. Um, and so even though you see these uh, connected by dotted lines, we really see our work together, that collective part being about how do we connect those dots through our programs, our practices, our policies, keeping equity at the center of everything we do. And events like today's core coffee chat and other trainings and workshops that we've held are offered as part of what we call the core Institute for innovation and impact. So really we try to, uh, create a learning hub, uh, an opportunity to uh, build new skills, to practice them together, um, to really work towards that mission and vision that we have for CORE and to be able to do that by continuously learning and improving. And so I will um, end that in terms of the overview of CORE. And I think we've got a little poll here for you just to get us started and see who we have in our virtual room. So we want to get a sense of what kind of grant writing experience do you have? Are you someone that would say you have none, that you're a newbie? Do you have some, you've done a little bit of it or a lot? It's part of your job that you do frequently or extensive, meaning it's all you do every day, <laughs> all the time. So I'll give everyone just a Couple moments to fill it out. And I think we have everyone that has responded. I'll give it maybe the five more seconds just to make sure. And here we go. I have quite a few of you are most saying uh, some experience, but we have quite a few that are saying none and a couple saying a lot. And nobody here has extensive experience, but I'm sure that all of you will have things to contribute either through your questions or um, insights that, and that you wanna share that will help um, make this conversation richer. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today um, and we will barely scratch the surface of the wonderful world of grant writing. But we will end with some resources for those of you who want to take a deeper dive. And we're also very open to holding more core coffee chats on different aspects of grant writing. So if you if there's a particular uh, topic that we're covering today that you'd like to learn more about or one that we're not covering, 
um, please let us know in the chat or emailing us afterwards, and we will do our best to respond to those. Um, as I mentioned earlier, please also use the chat to share your questions. We've set aside some time after we get through these topics to hear your questions and tips. And um, we're gonna try to get through, just quickly touching on each of these, the different types of grants that are out there. Some of you may have experience with one type or another. I can see in the chat, some people are particularly interested in a certain type of grant like philanthropy, foundation grants. Um, but there's certain things that are common to all of them that we'll talk about today. We'll talk about some things that you can do to prepare for grants, whether it's um, something that you're um, eyeing as a, a specific opportunity and deadline or not. And then just some tips and ideas about some sections that are common to most proposals, short, medium, or long. And then we'll um, have some tips throughout and we hope that you will share your tips and ideas as well. So types of grants, um, the main categories are the large federal uh, procurements from different federal agencies. There's some um, kind of mini-me's of those at the state and local government level, again, from different agencies. And philanthropy, so foundations of various types often have funding opportunities. Sometimes those are a competitive announcement. Sometimes they're by invitation. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then a lot of corporations have um, a philanthropic arm where they're trying to build goodwill and do good in their communities, um, especially when they have employees living in a certain place. So places like Target, for example, have some smaller grants that are for those kinds of purposes. And then there are different types of grants even within these categories. So some of them might be um, sponsorships for events. Some of them might be more for uh, research projects. Some of them are to try a new idea. So there's just a lot of variety to be aware of. What you can see here in the image is a screenshot from grants.gov and uh, Gisela will put that in the chat. So this is the main portal for federal government grants. Um, I, I'm sure that we could all raise our eyebrows at this idea that convenience comes to federal grants because it's actually a lot of hoops to jump through. But if that's something that you're interested in, um, the, the federal grant making process, this is a place to at least start exploring um, what's available. It's a very searchable database. There are all kinds of wild things from different agencies. Um, if you are interested in the federal grant game, then you do need to register your organization far, far ahead of time. So if people are interested, we could do a whole session just on this one source, but just, just to put in there as something to explore if you haven't already. So our first tip of several is to really know your funder. And this may seem really basic, but it's also kind of amazing how often we are tempted to skip this step just in the interest of efficiency and time. But um, even if you're recycling a past proposal, which we totally encourage so that that effort is not lost or wasted, um, it's important to realize that funders, like any organization, can change over time. Sometimes those changes can be quite dramatic. They can focus on a different geographic area or population or issue. So it's always a good idea to refresh your understanding, even of a funder that you think you know pretty well, to understand their priorities, the language they're using to describe their priorities. Maybe they have something that's really similar to what you do, but they use a different word or phrase to describe it. Um, and just to really understand where they're coming from so that you can connect your passion and your skills and your organization's qualifications to what they're seeing um, themselves. And so things to look at are perhaps a recent strategic plan from that funder. Have they upgraded their mission, vision, or value statements? Do they have a logic model on their website? All of those kinds of things can really um, yield a lot of benefit in crafting your proposal. And 
often when we're thinking about grant proposals, we think about a specific opportunity with a deadline and some parameters, some requirements from a request for proposals. And that's often what happens. But you don't have to wait for that request for proposals or RFP in order to start preparing your own grant proposals. So you can do a lot of things in the in-between times before the scramble, before a deadline. You can keep your organizational materials very well organized so that they're accessible and updated. So that can include everything from vision and mission statements to your own strategic plans, maybe um, lists of board members. Those are often requested. Um, if you have an indirect cost rate, and we'll talk about that in a bit when we talk about budgets, if you have that and there's documentation for how you arrived at it, that's often a requirement as well. Um, often lists of current partners can be helpful or partners you would like to be uh, connected to. So something that just has all of that kind of documentation um, at the ready in a folder that everyone can access who's working on a grant can be a, a good way to start. It's also helpful as part of your planning conversations to think about what might be a low, medium, or high ask of a funder. So maybe there's something that in the scheme of things doesn't take a ton of money. Maybe you have an event or a training that you wanna sponsor, but you wanna be ready with that idea and the justification for it um, if an opportunity knocks. And same for more ambitious things. Maybe you are thinking about something that would be a pilot or something um, just to test an idea and somebody might be willing to fund that. Or maybe you have an expansion of a program or you wanna implement some other uh, more elaborate program or initiative and be ready for that. So it doesn't have to be the full staffing plan, budget, et cetera, but just to have a little bit more runway when those deadlines start landing. Logic models and theories of change, you've heard us talk about um, quite a bit. And if you are, uh, if you have not attended some prior core coffee chat trainings on those topics, those are available um, as recorded webinars. But in any case, those are really good places to start for a lot of things that are grant related, including you know, how to identify gaps that you're trying to fill, what kinds of outcomes and objectives and metrics you're dealing with. And again, just can be something that's not necessarily tailored to a particular grant opportunity, but just helps you be ready when those land. And then finally, any internal or external resources in your organization um, are always good to know about. And they're not always the usual suspects. There's sometimes a person who is particularly great with um, putting budgets together. And there might be somebody who really collects those fantastic stories about your clients and their strengths and resilience. And you um, get to hear those sometimes, and maybe you want to capture some of those to liven up a proposal. Uh, maybe you have somebody who is a really great line editor or copy editor, and that's the person to line up ahead of time to proof your draft before it gets sent in. So all kinds of things come together to make a proposal stronger and having those resources identified ahead of time can save some time and anxiety. So let's talk about some of the common uh, grant narrative sections. We're gonna dive into each of these in a little more detail. Often there is something called a needs or problem statement, sometimes has other names, but it's basically just asking you, what is it that you are trying to respond to with these funds? And then the response section is the answer to how are you going to respond? What activities are you going to take on? What are your goals and objectives in doing this work that you're seeking funding for? And how will you evaluate it? What metrics will tell you that you've made progress or need to make some adjustments? Often funders want uh, to create incentives for you to have coalitions or partnerships that coordinate these efforts. So that's another thing that's common. Um, of course, you want to let them know your strengths as an organization and your staff strengths to, uh, to getting this work done and a budget that reflects all of that. So let's dive into those a little bit. But before we go into each of those sections, we wanted to share 
Another important tip that, again, may seem basic, but often gets lost in the shuffle of deadlines and trying to um, move quickly through a process on top of your day job. So a great thing to do is to read that request for proposals from the funder multiple times, because each time it, you'll notice different things about it. Um, the first time through, you might just be reading to understand the basic parameters, what are they asking for, how much of a fit is it for our organization or our project. And you might even start an outline to start capturing those ideas and jotting down any buzzwords or resources. Um, if there are resources mentioned in a request for proposals, they are not um, extra. Go ahead and click on those links, check those things out because they will tell you a lot about what the funder wants to um, accomplish, how they think about objectives and data, and they can really serve as cheat sheets and insights into the thinking of the funder. So um, try to treat those as not optional. And then you might be reading through the RFP a second or third time to really dive into some of the requirements, the criteria. Again, some of these might land differently depending on when you're reading them. So after you've had a chance to think about how you're going to staff something or as your budget is starting to take shape or your work plan, you might start noticing that some of those requirements are more or less restrictive than you originally thought when you first read it. And then of course there are the requirements about things like page lengths, font sizes, etc. Just before a deadline is a really terrible time to realize that your proposal is supposed to be double spaced, not single spaced. Been there, done that. It's better, of course, to do that right before it's due than after it's due, but those are just little curveballs that are hiding in there and just make sure you have all of that lined up um, at the outset. So let's go into those sections a bit. The needs or problem statement is asking what you know about the needs and problems you're trying to address in terms of some mix of qualitative and quantitative data, the fresher, the better. Doesn't always have to be official statistical data. It could be data that you've collected yourself from your clients or from your partners. And um, that's a, an opportunity to showcase how you know about these needs, the, how close you are to the issue, what insights you may have that others do not. And sometimes you might want to use some of those stories that your colleague is so good at collecting to illustrate these points in the needs section. We also really believe in including assets alongside needs and problems, whether they're asked for or not, just to show and to reinforce the idea that even in um, some really tough situations, there are reservoirs of strength and resilience that can be built upon and that are important to acknowledge and recognize. And we can talk a lot more about each one of these sections, and several of you probably have great ideas as well. But these are just some, some things to keep in mind as you're trying to respond to what's being asked to define the, the problem or issue you're addressing. The response section explains, as we mentioned earlier, how you plan to respond to the need or gap that you've already identified. Again, if you have a logic model or a theory of change, that's a huge head start. Um, but one way or another, you're going to be asked to explain um, what your goals and objectives are for this funding and how realistic it is that you can get that done. Sometimes there's a request for a specific work plan or timeline. If that's the case, make sure you follow their format if they have one. Um, because sometimes those can be pretty specific. And again, they might be a little different from how you would do it, but this is not the time to fight for your work plan as opposed to the funder's work plan. You can figure that out later after you get the funds. And this is also the time where you can identify some evaluation metrics um, and plan for how you might do that. Do you, is it a, a larger, effort that requires a formal evaluation? Is it something where you're just building on what something you're already tracking and how you're describing that? And then mostly that all of these things line up with each other. So 
Your work plan is not at odds with your staffing plan. Your budget reflects both of those things, the activities, the level of effort, how many people are involved, how many partner organizations or subcontracts. So all of that needs to, at some point, come together to be a coherent uh, response. And sometimes it's really helpful to actually start with the work plan instead of marching your way through the outline and doing the needs section first and then the response and then the partnerships and then the qualifications. Because the work plan is easier to adjust than other sections. And it can also alert you to some gaps or questions you may have. And it's just, it can be as simple as if we got these funds tomorrow, what's the first thing we'd have to do? Maybe you'd have to hire some staff and that puts moves that forward as an action step. But it will give you some idea of what the main steps are, what resources are required, how the sequence of tasks might work, which things can overlap, which things have to happen first in order for other things to happen. And just to think through the basics of what you're proposing to do. And then a lot of RFPs want you to talk about your partners. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem fair that agencies that are asking you for this don't always seem like they're collaborating in an excellent way themselves. And yet here it is, and they're asking for your letters of support or perhaps some more formal memoranda of understanding or agreement, examples of how you've collaborated with others in the past. Maybe you're part of a coalition that's accomplished some things. So all of that is fair game in discussions about partners and partnerships. And just remember that it is also fair to talk about new or intended partnerships if you don't already have them in place, as well as ones that are more established. If you are being asked to provide letters of support or memoranda of understanding and agreement, that is something that can happen sooner rather than later in the grant process and not be left to the very end. It's certainly a lot easier now that we can exchange PDFs and signatures and letterhead digitally when we used to have to collect them in person or mail them around. It was a, a bit more of a process, but it's still something that you wanna start early. The person who has to sign it might be on vacation. Maybe somebody, the decision maker isn't available for whatever reason, or you need to hammer out some details of how this partnership's gonna work. But all of those things take time and phone calls and possibly some meetings. So um, don't wait to the last minute to do what may seem like a very routine task. And then another common section is how to talk about your qualifications, both as an organization and as a team of staff, in addition to the partners that you're bringing to the table. So what are the different roles of people? Um, they may not be self-evident from titles or little um, biographies. What are the strengths that are unique to your organization and your staff? What's your track record in either doing something similar or something that could turn into something similar. Basically, you're trying to instill confidence in the funder that you have what it takes, or you will have what it takes. You know what's required to do the work that you're proposing to do. So that's your task with this section. And another tip is to brainstorm with your team, either the people implementing the program, the grant writing team, an evaluator, a board member, and, and think about what are the main things that we want the funder to realize about us? What, what, do, we, what do we think is really our, our strength, our wow factor, or unique about our organization that we're bringing to this? And don't just say those things in the staffing section. Look for other places to, to say that throughout the proposal so that if a reviewer happens to be distracted for whatever reason in this section, they still have a chance to learn about how great you are and how uniquely qualified you are to do this work. So for example, in your work plan, you might explain that, the re that you're developing this work plan and it's based on something that you've already successfully done in the past and your staff have experience with. And then you repeat that as, as room allows elsewhere. And then finally, 
there's always a budget and sometimes a narrative to go with it that is just describing and justifying the categories in the budget. This is one that some people find very straightforward and easy to do and others struggle with. And sometimes they are um, very unique to the proposal. So just make sure if the funder has a budget template that they want you to use or they're strongly encouraging you to use, that you try to shoehorn your budget into theirs because the reviewers have an easier time then um, reviewing the budget and comparing it to the, the narrative and to other proposals. Um, there are lots of variations on these. Sometimes they're multi-year budgets, sometimes they're single year budgets, sometimes they require matching funds from others, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they um, require documentation of different things and sometimes they don't. So just be sure that you're really clear about what is being asked of you as you fill out any kind of budget template. And of course, that goes for the rest of the RFP as well. You don't want to lose points over something that something like this. And in all of these categories, it really is helpful to pretend that you are a reviewer and we all need to take a moment and have sympathy and gratitude to the people who review grants. They are usually trying their best to look at many, many grants in a short period of time, many grant proposals. They have ideally received some training and support, but often are um, taking time out of their regular job or their free time to do this. Um, they have a hard job because a lot of review processes are trying to choose among excellent proposals or heartfelt proposals or both. And so it's really, really hard to be in that role of having to be the one who's deciding often by just a couple of points here and there, what is going to get funded or not because the funding requests often exceed what's available. So Ways that you can think like a reviewer are to build in time to have someone who has not been involved in writing and preparing the, pro the proposal review it for you. That could be somebody else in your organization who's good at that sort of thing. It could be a friend of your organization, a board member. It could be a favor that you've swapped when you've done that for someone else. And to make it easy for those internal and external reviewers, you can create some feedback forms that ask about, was everything clear? Would you have given us full points for this section? What seems um, off or missing? If somebody had to think about a sentence a few times, you wanna change that. Um, you can find those grant criteria and scoring criteria in the RFP itself. And it's also helpful to look at those multiple times, just like you're looking at the RFP multiple times. But the best way to think like a reviewer and learn a lot about how this works is to become one yourself. It does take time, it's not easy, but it's just great experience at seeing a lot of proposals and how they're crafted and learning about things that work because you are on the receiving end of a clear explanation, a great diagram, a wonderful way to describe staff, et cetera. So you, you can just get an, an, a great immersion in both the good and the not so good of grant writing by serving as a reviewer. So I think there are a couple of questions I'm seeing in the chat. Um, Michelle wants to know if it makes sense to proactively get letters of support after you've worked with a partner to keep on hand for future grants. I would wait till you had an actual grant because often um, you want it to be up to date for starters. And often there's something specific to the grant that, that even if you have sort of a, a template or boilerplate for your partners to fill out, you want them to be able to say, I really believe in this partnership because we've done X, Y, and Z together, or this organization is perfect for what this funding is about. And you just don't know the exact language or fit until you have that RFP. But certainly um, being ready for that is, um, is a good thing to, to do. Nicole, do you see other questions? I think that was the only question I saw in the chat. Okay. 
Does anybody have a question? Not in the chat. Raise your hand or so oh. Michelle has a hand raised again. I have raised your hand, Michelle. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the best way to kind of get practice is to be a reviewer. How how do you do that? How do you become a reviewer of grants? Well, sometimes there are um, organizations that put out a call for reviewers. Um, you could offer your services to people that you know are are doing um, grants. If you belong to a professional association, for example, um, in your field, they often uh, broker that on behalf of funders, foundations, um, public sector agencies. So, um, and that's actually something maybe that we could mention to groups like the Nonprofit Resource Center might be um, willing to start a list of people who are, who are willing to serve in those roles. So we can check into that. And we'll let you know if we hear any. Thank you. Welcome. Nicole, maybe we could, before you cover resources, maybe we can ask um, the group if anyone has a particular challenge that they want to share either in the chat or out loud. Like what's what's the thing that has um, made you want to <laughs> tear your hair out when you're writing grants or the thought of writing a grant? Like what are what are some of the things that you found to be really challenging? And then if you have a strategy for handling that or a workaround for that, that would be interesting to hear. I have a challenge. This is Kate Hinnenkamp from Community Action Board. We have, I'm sure like most, a bunch of old grant applications, successful and otherwise, that we steal from um, for new applications. And we have lots of brilliant things we've learned to say about our programs, but most applications split everything into these questions, right? Question number one, question number two, question number three, and they're never the same. I mean, I guess, why would they be? But it, I, it, we always struggle to figure out what do we put in which question? Does this fit here? Does it fit there? Sometimes like it fits topically with one question, but there's character counts or whatever. So. Any tips to make that less maddening of an experience? Mm. It's pretty maddening, I'll say that. But um, there are there are people who keep um, those. I don't know if you do this, but you can keep something that's as simple as um, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, or as elaborate as something that feels more like a little database with those snippets, so that you can search them more easily um, with particular terminology. So that's one thing that people do. Um, and then that's part, part of the updating um, um, that I mentioned earlier is to periodically go through some of those things and see, especially if you got feedback. I, I didn't mention getting feedback, but that is um, actually, that should have been another tip to always ask for feedback, um, especially if you were not successful to understand where, where you might have fallen short. Um, so, um, excuse me, turn that phone off, apologize. Maybe I can just add on to going, uh, tying it back to one of the tips you covered earlier, Nicole, about having an external or extra set of eyes reviewing it. Cause I know I've, I've been in that same situation too, Kate, where I think, oh my gosh, there's so much to say, so little space to say it. <laughs> And so, you know, and sometimes even just having a fresh set of eyes look at it after you've, you know, done your best to figure, okay, I'm going to take this piece and put it in a response to this question. But, you know, it's almost like you're kind of carving up, you know, previous text that you've written and, and try to make it fit then in, in different applications. And sometimes in the process of that, um, I know for myself, I found like, oh my gosh, I've just like, made it so much more complicated and hard to understand. And so like having that extra set of eyes can be a good gut check for, you know, if they're, if you ask someone, you know, read this RFP or the, you know, the requirements for the funding and then read my draft and tell me, does it flow well? Does it seem like it's answering the question? And sometimes that's the best that you can do. And it's still, you know, 
maddening and frustrating, but it can also provide that I don't know, validation or, or reassurance that, um, that, that what you've written actually flows well. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think the flow, that's a, a big part of it, right? And like trying to, in these very structured formats, like sound engaging and interesting and like, I try to not use my bureaucraties language, you know, as much as possible, but yeah, it's challenging. So yeah, having a, another set of eyes, it's a great suggestion. It is challenging. And another thing that happens is that, especially with those online portals that so many funders have moved to, if you can upload your narrative as a PDF, that's fine. But sometimes the ones that have boxes with character counts, you can't do a diagram, you know, or a um, it's not just the, the stories and the engaging language, but you can't even show in an efficient way um, what, you're, what you're trying to achieve. And so you get sort of um, shut out of using interesting visuals of all kinds or even call out boxes for, for quotes from people and that sort of thing. So that can be really frustrating too. And it's just, I think all of that will start to evolve more as the technology gets gets better and better, but um, yeah, plenty of frustrations. In, in all writing, I am a huge believer in outlining, and that's another place where you can see, you know, what, what things really fit in this section, either from our prior work and language that we loved, or something we have to craft anew, or something that's woven together from the, the two. Um, and sometimes there's something you really love from another proposal, we all have them. You have to let it go. It just doesn't work, doesn't fit, doesn't match. And that is painful. Other questions, comments? Anything else you're struggling with? Yeah, go ahead. Tilgore from us, the County of Santa Cruz and Public Health. I'm curious more from the beginning side of the grant writing process, do you have any tips on narrowing down the brainstorming process? Um, oftentimes grants that we look at, there's a lot of different pathways that we could take to fulfill the grant um, and a lot of different great ideas um, that often I feel like get fleshed out further along down the process, but do you have any suggestions of narrowing down those brainstorming ideas earlier in the grant writing process? I do. Um, so a few things. If you have a theory of change and a logic model, that can help you rule some things in as well as rule some things out because you're one of the things you're looking at is what really furthers our goals as an organization or the gaps that we've already identified. And then similarly, um, sometimes if you have a chance to look at what a funder has already funded recently, it can give you a lot of clues about the kinds of things that they're particularly interested in. And if you have multiple options of a way to proceed, um, and one of them or two of them or three of them seem much more aligned with what that funder has funded in the past or says they're interested in funding in the future, Maybe it's a particular um, type of project or a population or an approach, then um, that will give you a lot of clues. It's not necessarily in the RFP itself. It might be in what they have um, allocated funding to in the past. So those are a couple ways to do that. And then that, that tip I mentioned at the very beginning about being ready with your small, medium, and large asks. So it's going to be a different amount for every organization, but let's just say for argument's sake that a small grant might be something like $10,000 and a medium grant might be five times that and a large grant would be six figures. What are the projects that you already know you want to do that fit into those different dimensions um, or are close to them? And that way, when somebody comes out with a, an event sponsorship or a training um, type um, opportunity or something that supports um, a one-time upgrade of some equipment that you already have that in your back pocket ready to go. And, and of course, all the larger variations as well. 
but the, the, the less planning and advanced work you have, the harder the brainstorming is, I guess would be the, the gist of that. That's super helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. And I should just add that, um, I mean, Courtney, you're in a large agency. So that planning, those theories of change and logic models might exist at the agency level, but they're also good things to do at a program level. So you might want to look more narrowly at the, the parameters of whatever, whatever the universe is that you're working in as well. Anybody else? I should also just add that grant writing is hard. It's hard even if you're really experienced doing it um, because it's different every time. And it is it can be really devastating to put your heart and soul into something that doesn't get funded. But um, I really believe that no effort is wasted. All, all the ways you've talked about maybe recycling ideas and language as Kate said, but also um, every time that you're trying to design a project and pitch it to somebody else to support, whether it's partners or funders or both, you are refining your own ideas about it. And it is an opportunity to think through what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you explain it to others. Um, and sometimes it's a way to understand the resources that you may not have realized you had um, among staff or board or partners to support that work. So it's just, um, it's worth the effort and um, don't get discouraged if your first efforts aren't successful because that happens all along the, the spectrum of experience. And um, it is something that you can get better at, but no matter how good you are at grant writing, you are gonna have disappointments. So there's no, uh, there's no point where you win them all, sadly too many variables. Any other questions, challenges? I'm just gonna add to that. Um, I mean, Nicole Lezen is a, an amazing writer. I mean, she does, I mean, that is her wheelhouse, her, her profession and, um, and so I feel fortunate that like she's she's kind of my person when I <laughs> when I'm like, even though I teach trainings and workshops on how to create a logic model and turn that into a scope of work plan, I still doubt myself when I'm the one that's having to do it. And so I just want to say, like, um, even you know, like what Nicole is saying, even if you have been doing it a long time or do it often, like it's still like every it's like you've done one grant application it means you've done one grant application. <laughs> um, and, you know, my writing style is very like different or my approach to writing is probably less disciplined than Nicole Lessons. I wish I had more of her, <laughs> more of her discipline, but, you know, it's, it, you kind of find what works for you. And so like, for me, oftentimes what I find is I have to kind of force myself to just start writing and not get stuck on like trying to perfect that first sentence because I can edit and re-edit and re-edit the, you know, the same sentence over and over and then find that like, okay, no, I just need to move on. And so sometimes even just like dumping all the things that I think might be relevant and I have to try to remember, oh, I think, I feel like I've written that before somewhere. Where is that thing? So for me, sometimes it's just, you know, first like copy and paste everything that I can remember that I've written somewhere before that might be relevant. And then I can go through and figure out, okay, where does that belong? Um, you know, as Nicole said earlier, sometimes even in that process, I'll, I'll refine and write something. I think, oh, that's so good. Like that's so, <laughs> such a perfect way to say it. And then when it, when it comes down to it, I realize, nope, that's gotta go like, you know, space-wise, flow-wise, it just actually is not gonna add value. And so there's a lot of, you know, sometimes I'll even, you know, create multiple documents of like, these are my cut and paste notes that I don't want to completely delete yet, but because I might come back to them. Um, but just, it's, it's very much an iterative process that can feel really 
uh, frustrating and confusing <laughs> at the time. Um, but those are, that is kind of the nature of grant writing, unfortunately. Unfortunately, and thanks, Nicole, for the kind words, but I also, yeah, whatever works for you, it's just, you know, the other thing that's hard that we should talk about is deadlines. So all of us have different relationships with deadlines, sometimes on the same day. <laughs> and um, usually grant writing is on top of other stuff you're doing. Um, even if you're a grant writer for most of the time. And so it is really hard to corral your own timeline and align it with others. And so I should have mentioned another tip at the beginning is to have a group calendar for everything that you're doing and to do your best to make it land a day or two before the official deadline, because Weird things happen with those online portals. Um, sometimes they get clogged with traffic or there's a, an outage of some kind on your end or their end. And nothing is more stressful than trying to hit that send button at the last minute and nothing's happening. So um, if you're doing internal reviews, if you're doing letters of support, the budget needs to be signed off by a board, whatever the hoops are for each of those sections, um, just make sure that there is some room for error <laughs> um, of all kinds. Um, so um, let's see. And Kate's saying at CAB you usually work as a team to shave down word counts. Yep, that is so true. It's much easier to cut somebody else's than your own, your little darlings, as they're called. <laughs> um, Any other comments, questions, challenges? All right, well, just whatever your challenges are, even if you don't wanna voice them right now, just know that you're not alone. <laughs> can pretty much guarantee that. And Nicole, maybe we can ask people to put in the chat, like if there were uh, additional topics like this or copy yes. chats like this that we offered, um, what were what would some of those topics be that you'd want to hear more about, learn more about, practice? Um, yeah, that's, can, a, that's wants a great to put idea. anything in the chat that'll give us ideas about whether there's an interest to do more of this, and if so, like what some of those Oops. next topics might be. And and meanwhile, um, I. I always have mixed feelings about the for dummies titles just doesn't seem very nice but they are so great and I have actually used them for a lot of different topics um, including grant writing and um, I, I have composting for dummies as well on the shelf behind me so there you go um, anyway this is a great resource it's just been updated so this is a relatively new edition so it has some other resources and some um, some comments about online applications and portals and then this um, author Beverly Browning happens to be teaching a um, one of those uh, community college extension online courses on how to write a grant and it's got three different levels and it's you can get to it through Cabrillo or other community colleges um, and it's one of those um, virtual ones so I don't think you have even a specific meeting date it's all you know at your own pace so um, and I think those are pretty modest fees for those, but um, those are that's just one set of resources I'd recommend. And then I'll put in the chat, I realized after I did my slides that there's a great book called Writing for a Good Cause that just is about the, the actual language of trying to pitch things that I have found really helpful and inspiring. And every once in a while I go look at it again um, and always find something in it. So I'll put that in the chat for anybody who's interested. Um, and Nicole mentioned when you feel stuck, um, just cutting and pasting different things and ideas and worrying about sifting through them later, that's a great way to get unstuck. And also just reading something that has spoken to you in the past, it doesn't even have to be related to the topic at hand. I, I find that really shakes loose some ideas sometimes if I'm going back to a, a great opening of a chapter or something. Um, just just to get unstuck from that terrible blank screen. 
A lot of times when I'm reading articles or reports, I find myself thinking, ooh, I like the way they said that. That's basically a way to describe a theory of change, or that's basically a way to describe a needs or a problem statement. Oh, and oh, and that's a really concise, engaging, compelling way to describe a solution. So like when I'm reading other things, I'm I find myself actually reading it like, oh, if I were to <laughs> use that kind of language in a grant proposal or a report or something like, so I'll save those kinds of things if I think that those are good examples and inspiration that all that I might need. And then I just have to remember where I saved it. <laughs> um, so things like that too can be kind of a helpful ongoing habit to develop. All true. So finding it, that's the challenge, remembering it. Um, while we still have you, we also wanted to let you know about some upcoming core Institute events and we will be adding to these. Um, so stay tuned. But Nicole, do you wanna mention the, the TK Town Hall quickly and? Sure, we're um, co-sponsoring, co-hosting a bilingual town hall that is geared towards, it's meant for families, but we're gonna have some parent leaders um, from Cradle to Career also co-facilitate it with us, really to help provide information about enrolling in transitional kindergarten, what the options are. This is kind of the time of year when many families are doing that. And there have been a lot of changes in transitional kindergarten. And so uh, we're co-hosting an event for the community to um, spread awareness about that. And so registration will be coming soon for that. Um, and then in June, we have the last of this year's series with data share, really looking at local data in data share um, by each of the core conditions. So our topic in June will be uh, stable, affordable housing and shelter, which is the eighth core condition. And I'm then, trying to the, we had the, I had the wrong uh, description. <laughs> That's okay. We'll, we'll send it yeah. out in the okay. follow-up email. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And then we have our uh, feedback poll for today. We would appreciate uh seeing and receiving your feedback about what was helpful about today's session, what could have been better, ideas for the future. And just wanna thank everyone for being here.